Hello everyone and welcome to CT Anatomy. My name is Clark and I'll be taking you through lung, pleura, and heart embryological origins today. So to start this off, um, one important thing is to understand derivatives of the pharyngeal arches or aortic arches um, and trying to understand um, how these embryological origins play a part in making different structures important for clinical aspects such as uh, newborns and such. So one important thing that we discuss is the formation of different uh, main branches of arteries such as your common carotids, your subclavians, your aortic arch, your pulmonary trunk, and your ductus arteriosus. So we're going to go into those a little bit detail right now. So uh, initially what starts off you have all this kind of tubular system that goes up for the first few pharyngeal arches, uh, three through six. Um, and your first and second really make up your face which you'll learn in head and neck in your second term. Uh, but for this purposes, we're just going to look at three through six. So first thing you need to realize that arch five on the right and the left disappear. So they play no part in formation of this. However, um, arch six is important for the formation of the ductus arteriosus. We discussed this when we talked about heart, but this is important for fetal circulation so that the blood can ma be maintained going from the right to the left heart. Um, because in fetal circulation that's important because the oxygenated blood's coming from the mother from the right to the left side of the heart and then going out to the systemic circulation uh, which is needed for for supply of oxygen to the baby's body um, so this is our ductus arteriosus so this is the left pharyngeal arch six makes this up this is that like uh, light pink right here and uh, when a baby is born this does uh, close up if it remains patent so if you have a patient a little infant, say your neonatologist or such, and you have a patient that has a patent vessel in between the pulmonary trunk and the arch of the aorta, and then you're thinking, okay, this is the ductus arteriosus, which is a derivative of the left pharyngeal arch six. Okay, uh, now if you're talking about the full pharyngeal arch, or the whole, I'm sorry, whole aortic arch, then you're thinking of the three pieces that make this up. So it's going to be this light purple right here, this is uh, the aortic sac. This is just uh, the middle portion that forms all these little outbranchings to make all of these pharyngeal arches. Um, this is just this portion right here. It makes up the brachiocephalic trunk. And then there's a little part that connects to this, which comes off of a portion we talked about in heart, known as the truncus arteriosus. So this kind of is the last end of the heart tube before it attaches to the pharyngeal arches, which is R above. Then uh, following that, you have uh, pharyngeal arch 4, which is this kind of hot pink right here. Very small section, more large in this kind of shape thing, but ends up being a very small section in between your left common carotid and your left subclavian artery. And then um, following that, you just have a nice descending uh, aorta here. Uh, the last, last bit of pieces here is going to be your right subclavian. Your right subclavian is a portion of your right arch 4, uh, which is this guy right here. So right arch four makes your right subclavian, which is this little pink, and then it continues out as the rest of the vessel here. So uh, of course, with our development in embryology, we always have some odd anomalies and different uh, malformations that can occur. And so we have to understand uh, how to describe these and how to view these in images. Um, some of these are more difficult to view in imaging, such as CAT scan and such, but uh, so uh, cartoon pictures like this are better to depict them. So one of them is known as the double arch of uh, the aortic aorta or double aortic arch. So this occurs when um, one of the first steps fails to occur. So what happens is this first step, um, this uh, subclavian actually is attached here. So this is the uh, portion that attaches to the left uh, seventh intersegmental artery. Uh, they usually stay together. If this doesn't become patent or, or break off, uh, if this doesn't break off, then you have this arch that wraps around anything that goes through there. And one of the things that goes through there is going to be your um, esophagus. So you have your esophagus here, and you see how this part didn't go away and remains there. So you have your nice little heart shape kind of thing. Uh, what happens when this eventually develops is you'll have uh, all this all both of these sides of this arch kind of wrapped around all these structures, your trachea and your esophagus. And this could be very suffocating for a respiratory system if it squeezes strong enough, 
or if it can block off some ability to be able to swallow or, or eat properly. Uh, so this needs to be fixed right away once the baby is born and starts feeding. Uh, another thing is coarctation of the aorta. This is actually quite common, um, more than uh, quite a bit of heart defects. I have actually seen this before. Um, and so what happens is coarctation of the aorta is really just an impingement or stenosis of uh, this uh, aortic arch in different places. So there's post-ductal, so you remember our uh, ductus arteriosus, so if the uh, impingement occurs after, like more towards the descending aorta past this ductus arterius, arteriosus is known as postductal. Then there's preductal, which obviously is before the ductus arteriosus, and then there's juxtaductal, which is right on, um, right at the level of that uh, ductus arteriosus. And then you can have a little uh, extensive preductal coarctation, which is just a very long segment of this, it's not just one little small. Uh, segment. So what happens is you s have this tiny amount or this tiny hose that you're trying to get this all this blood flow through, but it can't. So it has to go out other ways. So how what it does is it forms this collateral circulation. So um, because it's impinged here, this uh, blood starts to flow up. You're like subclavian and such like that, and then you form aberrant vessels. And these aberrant vessels can become very dilated and push against bones of your rib cage. And so you'll, what you'll find is notched ribs, like in an X-ray. So if you see an x-ray that's shown to you and you see little notches in the ribs and they say, oh, what could be the problem with this uh, baby or this infant? You're going to say, okay, it's most likely going to be uh, collateral circulation uh, due to coarctation of the aorta. Uh, and that's going to cause that uh, swelling of those vessels because the blood has to go out of these tiny ones in order uh, to get down to the lower blood supply. Another uh, way that they could describe this is you'll have greater uh, blood pressure in your arms or your upper limbs than your lower limbs because you can't get that blood out down the aorta, down to the iliacs and stuff to get down to your leg. So your blood pressure will be very low down here on the other side of this impinged hose, where up here will be very high blood pressure going through the subclavian and the axillary artery out to your arm. So that's very important. Uh, to be able to to point that out of a vignette and figure out that uh, this this is coarctation of the aorta. Uh, some other important mediastinal things are, are nerves that are oriented around this arch. And so um, during the embryological uh, development, we talked about how this right subclavian kind of branches off uh, and forms its own little thing over here. Uh, and what happens is we have nerves that come right under those arches. So if we go back to the here, um, right under this, we have two nerves that come right through here, the right and the left uh, recurrent uh, laryngeal nerves, which is a branch off of vagus. So these nerves come right through this little loop and they come back up. However, what happens is when this breaks off right here, now instead of getting hooked uh, under the front side here, or the arch, now it actually gets hooked under here, which is under the subclavian. So uh, on the right side, the recurrent laryngeal actually loops around your subclavian. But on the left side, because we didn't have that part disappear, it actually now just hooks under the arch of the aorta as your left recurrent branch. So if you have some sort of surgery, you have to go in, a uh, doctor goes in for surgery, and they're like, oh, we're worried about damaging a branch that's hooked around or under the aortic arch, then you're talking about your recurrent branch or a branch off of the vagus nerve. And uh, patients will come in with hoarseness, uh, difficulty, with uh, phonation or, or words um, because uh, recurrent laryngeal is innervating the muscles in order for speaking with your vocal cords properly. So they're gonna sound very hoarse. Uh, vagus nerve then continues on and runs along the anterior side of your heart. Uh, so that could be another thing is a surg surgery uh, involving the front part of your heart, maybe a coronary bypass. You've gotta watch out for a nerve then you're really thinking at that point of the vagus nerve. So now about the diaphrag, uh, diaphragm and uh, its hiatus, which is going to be all the, th the three holes uh, in the diaphragm that allow passage of, of three great uh, important uh, structures. And so what the way uh, or mnemonic that you'll be given in class, as well as what I'm giving you right now, is I ate 10 eggs at noon. So I ate 10, I ate I, so for I for inferior vena cava, 10 eggs, so 10 eggs. Um, uh, so, uh, I ate, I ate, and then 10 eggs at noon. 
So I ate 10 eggs at noon. Uh, that's going to remember all these things. So I is for your inferior vena cava exiting or going through the diaphragm at level of T8 of your vertebrae. Esophagus passing through your diaphragm at the level of T10. And abdominal aorta at passing at T12. So that's where these three pass through the diaphragm, and that's really the only significant portion of this. So now a little bit more about the diaphragm and its kind of development. So before we dive into the embryo embryological portion of this, we need to figure out uh, what are the basic pieces of the diaphragm, basic, basic. So I'm not going to go into super detail here, but one of the most important things is going to be your central tendon. So you have this tendon right in the middle of the diaphragm. It makes kind of like a boomerang shape. So this boomerang shape thing, central tendon, is made from the septum transversum. So uh, if you just think of throwing a boomerang, it kind of stays flat around transversely in the air and comes right back to you. So this boomerang shank is going to be your septum transversum. Terrible analogy, but uh, hopefully that sticks now because I said that. So um, then the, the next thing is going to be you have somites. So in an embryo, you might have seen on its back like little spinal bu bubbles. Looks like little spinal vertebrae kind of sticking out. Those are called somites, and they form the musculature of the diaphragm. Uh, and then... Uh, you have a lateral wall mesoderm doing the peripheral part or lateral as edges of this. And uh, you have uh, posterior lateral parts or pleural peritoneal, peritoneal membranes, which is just this remaining portion of this. And then you have a crura, which kind of wraps around your esophagus. So crura mean, just means um, like legs, uh, legs around here. So the crura uh, are formed from the dorsal mesentery of the esophagus because the esophagus passes right here. So you form a little bit of that muscle around the esophagus as well. So now a little bit about lung development. So this is very important. Um, there's a lot, a lot of details that you're just going to be overwhelmed with that they go over in this embryo lecture. But don't get too, uh, too messed up. The most important thing is just the basics. You're going to need to know your histology absolutely when you get to this section. Uh, but most importantly, as far as physiologically uh, develop, or physiological de development and uh, anatomical development, they really want to uh, have you understand the name of a stage that is vital for survival. And this is known as your canalicular period, so weeks 16 to 26. Uh, so this is uh, your third trimester, or I'm sorry, uh, your, yeah, your uh, second to third trimester. Uh, so this is important because uh, in this uh, area or this time frame, uh, you start making uh, type 2 alveolar cells and type 2 alveolar cells or pneumocytes start secreting surfactant. This is a kind of a, a type of material that coats the inner lining of all the alveoli and allows it from or stops it from collapsing. So if you just think of lining the inner side of all these alveoli with negative magnets, and you know how negative magnets repel each other. So if you line the whole thing, and the, it, the alveoli start to get smaller, now the magnets are more repelling, so it keeps it open. It doesn't allow it to collapse. So that's pretty much what surfactant uh, in an algae form does for uh, the lungs. And one of the most important things that comes arise with this is uh, its clinical relevance is developing uh, the trachea and the esophagus separately. So um, what happens is usually you canalize or open, it's a, another way of saying canalize, uh, open up a nice little tube of esophagus that goes down so that it can go to your stomach and your GI system can form properly. Then you form a bud off that separates and has a little septum in between it and that forms your trachea and your lungs start to develop from that. However, if these get stuck together or form like some weird aberrant connections, like you can see in all these four types down here, then you're going to be having what is called a, a fistula. A fistula is a, a, a anomaly of incorrect communication between two things that aren't supposed to be connected. That's what a fistula is. Um, so for a tracheoesophageal fistula, or TEF, uh, it's just the uh, abnormal communication between the trachea and the esophagus. Uh, what can happen is it leads to multiple conditions that you can find uh, very early in pregnancy known as polyhydraminous. So what happens is the baby's blood, uh, or baby gets blood supply from the mother, which has water and all sorts of nutrients in it. Uh, this gets filtered through the baby's kidneys and the baby pees it out in um, the, the amniotic fluid. 
Now what happens is under normal cycle, the baby then will uh, well, breathe it in obviously, but uh, drink it too. When the baby drinks this fluid, it will go into his blood or her blood supply and then go back to the mother. So this water kind of gets filtered through and, and cycled around. However, if you break part of this cycle, if you stop the baby from swallowing it because you have maybe atresia of your esophagus or some weird aberrant thing where uh, you're decreasing the ability for uh, fluid to get down to your stomach, uh, such as like here, right here is your esophagus, and here's where it ends. If this occurs, then you're not going to be sending any water back to the mother. So she's going to be giving you water, but you're not going to be giving the mother back any water. So it's just going to start filling in, filling in, filling in. So you're going to have polyhydramnos uh, as a condition here. So TF is associated what is uh, what is known as vacterol associated disorders, V-A-C-T-E-R-L, associated disorders. Uh, tracheoesophageal fistula stands for that T in there, and this is kind of a mnemonic uh, given by the Medical uh, Association of Medical Terminology, and this is something that's used to describe all the possible things that are can be associated with any one of these that are given. So if a baby has... TEF, it's most likely that they could possibly have some of these other anomalies. Um, and so what I did was I took out the T because we already knew TEF, correct? And then I reorganized the letters just to make a nice clever, clever mnemonic um, in order to remember these. So this is uh, set up as clever is uh, cardiac anomalies, limb defects, esophageal atresia. Remember a tree. So you have a plug made of a tree. So this is uh, atresia, is what that means. Uh, vertebral anomalies, uh, anal atresia, again, atresia, so anal plug, and renal anomalies. So that is your clever mnemonic for remembering all the other associated uh, conditions or anomalies that could occur with tracheal esophageal fistula. So remember always vacterol, V-A-C-T-E-R-L, associated disorders is what it's called, but this uh, mnemonic I made or changed around just helps you uh, remember the clever way of organizing what all these mean uh, so you don't forget them. So now, uh, last thing is uh, a little bit about pleural development. We talked about some of these earlier in thorax, so uh, I'm not going to go into super detail into them, but you do have uh, a couple that weren't given. So diaphragm uh, eventration. So this is when you have defective musculature. Uh, this usually leads to paradoxical respiration. It's not a hole, so it's not actually uh, a hernia. Uh, that occurs through the diaphragm where your internal uh, or abdominal organs push up into your thoracic cavity, but it's really just weak musculature. So what happens is when you go to breathe in and inspire, you actually push a lot of extra pressure on your abdominal cavity. And so you have weak muscle on one side, then the uh, intestinal organs and stuff like that can push up into your thoracic cavity. And this is known as paradoxical respiration. Uh, if you're confused on that, they have plenty of YouTube videos. You can check out what that looks like. Uh, and then um, we have, again, some other di diaphragm uh, problems, such as absence of the central tendon, and that's just a defect in the septum transversum, which we talked about, that little boomerang. And then uh, we have, uh, again, tracheoesophageal fistula. And now as far as term-wise, if they were to say, why did this form? It's just literally a straight definition due to failure of the tracheoesophageal septum. And last is uh, when we talked about that 16 to 26 week canalicular period. Uh, if you ha are a, bo a, ba a born baby or infant before this time uh, and before you produce all that surfactant, you'll under most likely undergo what is known as respiratory distress syndrome because your lung and uh, alveoli will be starting to collapse. And this is due to insufficiency of surfactant, also known as DPPC, dipalmatyl phosphatidylcholine. And that's all we have for you today uh, for this video. Definitely check out our other videos. Don't forget to su subscribe, and I hope this helps.